Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 1. Last time, we talked about atoms and the protons and neutrons that make up the nuclei. Today, we'll move on from that and talk about molecules and their names. By the end of the video, you'll know the names and formulas of almost 7,500 different molecules. Along the way, we'll meet some characters from the French Revolution, including some who lost their heads. To get there, let's start with something we learned last time when we were talking about atoms. I mentioned that a normal atom doesn't have a charge. That means it must have an equal number of protons and electrons, so that the positive protons and negative electrons cancel out. For example, here's a boron atom. Boron has an atomic number of 5, so it has 5 protons. Since it's a neutral atom, it also has 5 electrons. This particular atom also has 6 neutrons, but since neutrons don't have a charge, that doesn't change the fact that it's a neutral atom. The same thing applies when we combine atoms to form molecules. Normally, molecules are neutral, so the total number of protons and electrons in a molecule must be equal. For example, here's a molecule of carbon dioxide. It contains a carbon atom and two oxygens. The carbon has six protons, and each oxygen has eight, for a total of 22 protons. That means it must have 22 electrons, too. We don't normally need to worry about the number of neutrons since they don't affect the charge. So atoms and molecules are usually neutral. But it's possible to change that. We can give an atom or a molecule a charge so that it's not neutral anymore. Let's do that. Here's a lithium atom. It has three protons and three electrons. Suppose I want to give this atom a positive charge. How would I do that? You might think there are two ways. First, I could give the lithium an extra proton. But that won't work. Remember that the number of protons is the atomic number. So by adding a proton, I've changed the atomic number from 3 to 4. But atoms with an atomic number of 4 are beryllium atoms. So by adding a proton, I've changed the atom from lithium to beryllium. So if we want to give lithium a positive charge, we can't do it by adding a proton. Instead, we'll have to take away an electron. Now we have three protons, but only two electrons. We would write the symbol for this as Li for lithium, with a positive sign for a superscript. Technically, this isn't an atom anymore. Atoms are always neutral. Once an atom has a charge, it's called an ion. An ion is just an atom or molecule that has an electrical charge. If we go ahead and take away another electron, this would mean there are now two electrons missing, so the ion would have a charge of positive 2, which we write this way. Notice that the number is written first and the plus sign second. This style of writing the charge in an ion has been around since the late 19th century, which is when the Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius started to understand how ions are formed by adding or taking away electrons. We'll talk about Arrhenius a lot more in later chapters. So, we can create a positive ion by taking away electrons. In the same way, we can create a negative ion by adding electrons. For example, if we add an electron to this oxygen atom, we'll get an O- ion. And if we add a second electron, we'll get an O2 minus ion. Remember, the number comes before the negative sign. So that's how we can turn an atom into an ion. Positively charged ions, like this lithium atom, are called cations, and negatively charged ions are called anions. We can also make cations and anions out of molecules. For example, here's a molecule of nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen has 7 electrons, and each oxygen has 8, so there are a total of 23 electrons. If we add an electron, we'll have a nitrogen dioxide anion with a charge of minus 1. So where did the electron that we added go? Is it attached to one particular atom within the ion? We'll talk about that a lot more in detail in a future video. But the short answer is that the electrons are shared between all the atoms in an ion, 
so the electron we added isn't on any one particular atom. If we had taken away an electron instead of adding one, we'd have a nitrogen dioxide cation with a charge of positive one. When we make ions like these, which have more than one atom in them, they're called polyatomic ions. It turns out that some ions are much more common than others. For example, lithium minus ions are very rare, but lithium plus ions are very common. If you look at the periodic table, there's a connection between where on the periodic table an atom is and what charges are common for the ions we can make from it. Ions of the atoms in the first column of the table usually have a charge of plus one. So for example, sodium plus is very common, but sodium plus two, or sodium minus, are very rare. In the same way, ions from the second column of the table usually have a charge of plus two. If we go to the other end of the periodic table, ions from the second to the last column of the table often have a charge of minus one, and ions from this column often have a charge of minus two. Atoms in the very last column of the periodic table usually don't form ions. It's very difficult to add electrons or take them away from these atoms, so they usually stay neutral. We'll talk about the reason for that in a future video. Also, it turns out that lots of the elements in the middle of the periodic table can form ions with lots of different charges. For example, iridium can form 11 different ions. For that reason, it's not possible to come up with a simple rule for the charge on the ions in the middle of the periodic table, like we did for the first two and the last three columns. So now that we know about ions, we're ready to talk more in depth about molecules. We can form thousands of different molecules by combining different ions together. When we do that, the charges on the ions must always cancel out so that the molecule we get is neutral. For example, we can combine lithium and oxygen. If we look on the periodic table, we see that lithium is in this column, so it has a charge of plus one. And oxygen is over here, so it has a charge of minus two. When we combine these ions, we need the charges to cancel out, so we'll need two lithium ions. That means that the formula of the molecule will be Li2O. Notice that the number of lithium ions is a subscript, not a superscript like the charge was. Also notice that when we write the formula of the molecule, we don't still write the charges that were on the ions we made it from. Finally, the last thing to notice is that we usually write the cation first and the anion second. As another example, if we combine potassium and iodine, we can look at the periodic table and see the charge on the potassium is plus one, and the charge on iodine is minus one. To make the neutral molecule, we will just need one of each, so the formula is Ki. When we only have one of a particular ion, we don't need to write one as the subscript. We can also make molecules using polyatomic ions. For example, here's a polyatomic ion with the formula NH4+. We can make a molecule with that by combining it with chlorine, which has a charge of minus one. To make a neutral molecule, we'll need one of each, so the formula is NH4Cl. Now let's make a molecule by combining that NH4 plus ion with sulfur. From the periodic table, we see that sulfur has a charge of minus two. So to make the neutral molecule, we'll need two NH4 plus ions and one sulfur. If we just put the subscript two after the NH4, it would be really confusing it's hard to tell if the two is just for the hydrogens or for the whole NH4. To make it clear, we put parentheses around the NH4 and put the two subscript after the parentheses. This happens a lot. Whenever you have more than one of a polyatomic ion, you should put parentheses around it and the subscript after that. If you only have one of the polyatomic ion, you don't need the parentheses. 
It turns out that thousands of useful molecules are made by combining ions this way. For example, some of the bright pigments we use in paints are made of ions from just two elements. The green color of this car comes from a molecule made of chromium ions and oxygen ions. And this white pigment comes from titanium ions and oxygen ions. So, now that we know how to write formulas for these compounds, let's talk about their names. Naming things is an important skill in science, and for a very good reason. For instance, take these two animals. Looking at them, you might guess that they're related, but how closely? You can tell that one is reddish and the other is black, but are they still the same species? You can tell whether they're related or not if you know their scientific names. This one is called Scurrius grenatensis, while this other one is called Scurrius griseus. So they are related. They both belong to this genus Scurrius, which is part of the squirrel family. But the names tell you that they aren't the same species. This one is a red-tailed squirrel, and this one is a western gray squirrel. The same is true for chemicals. The names of compounds can tell you whether or not they're related to each other, and if so, how? For instance, these two compounds are ammonium nitrate and ammonium bromide. Just as with the names of the squirrels, the fact that both these chemicals start with the same word tells you that they're related. In the same way, these two compounds are sodium sulfide and zinc sulfide. This time it's the second word that's the same, and this too tells you that they're related. Let's find out how they're related. It's actually pretty easy to name compounds. Most compounds, like the ones we've been talking about, have names made of two words. If there are no polyatomic ions, the first word is just the name of the atom the positive ion came from. And the second word is the name of the negative ion, but with the end of the element chopped off and replaced with the suffix ide, I-D-E. For example, earlier we had this molecule. So to make its name, the first word is the name of the positive ion, and the second word is the name of the negative ion, with the N cut off and replaced by IDE. So this is lithium oxide. We also saw this molecule earlier. Its name would be potassium iodide. Here's the third molecule we saw. This time it has a polyatomic ion. What do we do about that? We do not try to name this by naming all the elements in the polyatomic ion. Instead, polyatomic ions have their own special names, which I'm afraid you're going to need to memorize. There aren't too many that I expect you to know, but you should try to learn them as soon as you can. We'll use them very often in this course. Here's a list of the polyatomic ions I would like you to learn. You should learn their names and also their formulas, including the charges. Don't forget the charge. The charges are important when you're trying to figure out the formula for a molecule. So to get back to our example, this ion is called ammonium. So this molecule is ammonium chloride. Here's another example. The polyatomic ion is acetate. So this molecule would be called aluminum acetate. There's one more complication. Remember I said that many of the elements in the middle of the periodic table can form ions with many different charges. That can cause a problem with our names. For example, here are two different molecules made from cobalt and fluorine. Using our system for naming, we would call this cobalt fluoride. But we would also call this second molecule cobalt fluoride. That's a problem. When we talk about our experiments, we want to be sure that other people know what molecules we're talking about. The trouble comes because the cobalt in the first molecule has a charge of plus two, and in the second molecule, it has a charge of plus three. Here are the different elements in the periodic table where this kind of thing can happen. Notice that it's most of the center of the periodic table, which are called transition elements, plus a few metals on the right side of the table. When we name a compound that contains one of these elements, 
we have to specify what charge its ion has. For example, in this compound, the cobalt has a charge of plus 2, so the name of this compound is cobalt 2 fluoride. Notice that we're using Roman numerals and putting them in parentheses after the name of the ion. This compound would be called cobalt 3 fluoride. Remember these two compounds? Let's try naming them. This one has chromium in it, and that's one of the transition metals. So to name this compound, we need to figure out what its charge is. How will we do that? Fortunately, we know the charge on the oxygen. It's in this column, so the charge is minus 2. We know the charges on the oxygens and the chromiums must cancel out. There are three oxygens, so overall the negative charges add up to minus 6. That means the chromiums must add up to plus 6, so each chromium must have a charge of positive 3. So this compound is called chromium 3 oxide. Notice that the number in parentheses is the charge on each chromium atom, not the overall charge on the chromiums. Now let's try this one. It contains titanium, which is another transition metal. There are two oxygens, so their charges must add up to minus 4. So the titanium must have a charge of plus 4. So this molecule's name is titanium 4 oxide. The person who came up with the naming system we just talked about for molecules was the French chemist Antoine Lavoisier. Lavoisier was one of the most important chemists of all history, and we'll talk about him and his work on several occasions in future videos. In this picture, he's seen with his wife, Marianne, who helped him with many of his experiments and helped him write down the results so they could be published. Lavoisier was a humanitarian in addition to being a chemist, and he worked on a lot of public service projects, including purifying water from the Seine, improving street lighting throughout Paris, and reforming the prison system to make them more humane and hygienic. But unfortunately for him, he was also involved with the collection of taxes in the area where he lived. And when the French Revolution came, the resentment over taxation caused him to be arrested. Although he was very careful about keeping records regarding his public work, the court charged him and 27 other civil servants with fraud, and all of them were convicted and executed by guillotine. The year before that, all intellectual societies, including the French Academy of Sciences, were suppressed and disbanded by the revolutionary government. It didn't take long for the French government to regret what it had done to Lavoisier. A year and a half after his execution, Lavoisier was cleared of any wrongdoing, and statues of him are now found on the façade of the Louvre and of the Hôtel de Ville in Paris. Well, that's it for now. Believe it or not, you now know enough about chemical formulas and chemical names to be able to identify several thousand different compounds. You'll get plenty of practice doing that in class soon. Until next time, have a good week.